This is a tale of men and of their willingness to endure hardship and risk life above and beyond the call of duty in the service of country and humanity for brevity and rearrange. The President's Cabinet approved the exit. As Secretary of the Navy, James V. Forrestal explains the reasons for the enterprise. There is only one untouched reservoir of raw materials left in the world, and that's in the region known as Antarctica, an area larger than the combined area of the United States and Europe. The American government is sending a naval expedition to that region. The purpose is to train our Navy in polar operations so that it may better perform its function of preserving the peace upon the seven seas of the world. Beyond that, the American government is seeking to do its share in the discovery and the release to the world of the unknown treasures of Antarctica in the interests of all mankind. Sums up to this gentleman, the secretary has approved our plans, confirming you, Admiral Byrd, as the officer in charge of the expedition, and you, Admiral Cruzen, as the task force commander. And we get what we need. That makes Operation High Jump the greatest polar expedition in history. Admiral, time is going to be our greatest handicap. By the time we get through this very difficult ice pack, the summer will have ended, and the fall will have set in. Never before has anyone attempted to take a fleet of thin-skinned steel ships through 300 miles or more of crushing ice pack. I have great faith in your skill, courage, and determination. And now, gentlemen... Admiral Nimitz reviews the Ottens' plan. The expedition will comprise three groups a central land plane group to explore the interior from Little America, and two seaplane groups, the eastern to map that half of the continental shoreline, and the western to map the opposite coast of Antarctica. After the original orders have been issued, three months of planning are needed to organize the giant venture. This is Robert Taylor speaking. At the world's greatest naval base, Norfolk, Virginia, ships of the central and eastern groups are loading. The flagship, Mount Olympus, equipped with powerful radio and radar, will serve as the leader's voice of command. Admirals Byrd and Cruzen come aboard to check staff preparations, food, fuel, and clothing for 4,000 men. Byrd greets staff officers who have fitted out the expedition. Not a few vessels, but a fleet. Officers and men, not hundreds, but thousands, and pilots by the score. The chief of staff, Captain Quackenbush, calls up the fleet's youngest recruits to meet the admirals, who name them Running Jump and High Jump. The pups are unimpressed by rank. Running Jump and High Jump are first arrivals from the Chinook Kennels at Wanalancet, New Hampshire, where sailors are learning the art of navigating dog sleds. Everything happens to sailors. But soon they come to understand and to love the huskies. They watch their dogs carefully to see that they have enough to drink and enough to eat, and always at the right time. The dog watch blue jackets practice the patient care that will keep the dogs in prime form. Not only food, but daily attention to their eyes so that they may not suffer the dreaded Arctic snow blindness. And the inevitable vitamin pill. And even dogs can't escape these days of ABCD health. The boys learn all the tricks. Tickling of the throat, and a pat on the nose gets the pills down. The dog sleds are the small boats of the Antarctic. Each carries 600 pounds with 10 dogs hauling. Each dog's harness is tailor-made, carefully fitted to avoid the chafing that has been fatal to many a sled dog at below zero temperatures. The Husky's paws are equally important. There are canine snowshoes precisely notched for the pulling claws. In cut-down auto chassis, the sailor drivers finish training. Huskies so often have meant life itself to Admiral Byrd that he calls them his Antarctic Life Insurance Company. From Norfolk, Admiral Cruzen sails aboard the Mount Olympus. His crews are a cross-section of the country's manhood. Admiral Byrd will follow later in the carrier, Philippine Sea. The Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind, 
powerful plow horse of the expedition, backs out. The seaplane tender, Pine Island, is first to stand out to sea. Steaming south via the Panama Canal, the fleet must cover 12,000 miles to reach Antarctica. At the 100th meridian west, the groups are to separate, and the central group proceed to a rendezvous point at Scott Island. This is Van Heflin speaking. Sailing day at San Diego finds the Western Group helicopters practicing final pinpoint landings on the new deck of the seaplane tender Curry Tuck. They are to serve as eyes of the fleet when it buffets through the pack ice, and when need be, to go on rescue missions. For exploration, three Martin Mariners called PBMs with a flight range of 3,000 miles are spotted aboard the Curry Tuck. Ships of the Western Group will proceed 10,000 miles south to the Balleny Islands, 860 miles to the west of Little America. Aboard the Mount Olympus, now heading south in the Pacific, Admiral Cruzen gives a traditional command, and up goes a strange flag. The Jolly Roger, signifying the crossing of the equator and authorizing the ancient shenanigans of the sea, whereby all land lovers are painfully presented at King Neptune's court. The veteran shellbacks copperplate the polywog's interiors with a mixture of cylinder oil and chewing tobacco. Next, the polywogs must kiss the bosun's the only kiss they'll have for many a long month. They wind up with a dunking and a final whacking to warm them up, officers and men alike. Wearing the whiskers of Neptunus caninus, Ricky, the veteran husky, presides as the pups become doggy shellbacks. The oncoming shadow of the Antarctic intensifies preparations. Bamboo is split for trail marker sticks. These, topped with flags, will form lifelines to guard the men against losing the trail in blinding blizzards. Small details, but vitally important in the wilderness of ice. The dogs are inoculated against infection. Now the serious business of the sea takes over. Danger menaces the fleet oiler, Kakapon. She must fuel the fleet now to lighten her cargo of four million gallons of oil. If storms strike her, plates may warp, rivets shear, and her back may be broken. And ahead are the dreaded roaring 40s. Deck parties run with hauling lines, bringing over the Kakapon's captain for a conference. The ships are still on course, forging ahead. But the Kakapon salty skipper smells storm coming. Few ships travel this lonely ocean, so there are no weather reports. We've got to finish this job fast, he roars, or we'll be caught in a stiff blow. And blow she does. skies, but still the gale blows hard. Aboard the seaplane tenders, rolling decks imperil the big seaplanes. deeper. A sudden lurch. The Navy cameraman taking these pictures is thrown, his leg broken. He swings his camera, catches the nose of one plane smashed in. Swings aft, spots another plane overboard, sinking in the wake. Lost. no loss of life, but below, in sick bay, the surgeons are busy with the injured. Today, with Navy's modern science, an injured seaman is soon up and about. We go back now to Norfolk and sailing day for Admiral Byrd. Six DC-3s, called R-4Ds by the Navy, make the longest taxi run in Navy Yard history, 
each with crewmen riding the tips of their 98-foot wings. Poles and buildings have been removed to clear their way to the 30,000-ton carrier, Philippine Sea. Admiral Byrd will sail the carrier close to the edge of the pack ice, then fly his six 30,000-pound land planes from her deck, 800 miles across the pack to Little America. A daring and dangerous plan, but precedent was made in 1942 by Jimmy Doolittle and his much smaller B-25s, Tokyo bound from the carrier Hornet. As the Philippine Sea sails on her 10,000 mile voyage, the advanced group under cruising has voyaged far south. They sight their first icebergs just above the Antarctic Circle. Careful bearings are taken, for the hulls of these ships are no thicker than was the steel skin of the Titanic. The treacherous ice is the enemy now as then. But danger is the sailor's business. His delight is in preserving home traditions, the Christmas tree and Christmas dinner. taking the central group deeper into icebound seas. Now, by the far-seeing eye of radar, the bridge learns of land ahead, and flag communications passes the word to the fleet. Scott Island, dead ahead, all ships rendezvous. 600 critical miles of their 12,000-mile voyage still to go. The ice pack ahead has been the executioner of many gallant ships. Cruzen summons captains and executive officers for a staff conference. While the staff confers, a small landing boat sets off for Scott Island, named in honor of the heroic British explorer, Captain Robert Falcon Scott, who lost his life a generation ago, trying to fight his way back from the South Pole. In such surging seas, landing is impossible. The boat heads back from Mount Olympus with serious news. Cruzen must abandon his plan for a weather station here on this rugged submarine mountain. Time presses hard. With his operation officers, Cruzen transfers his flag from Mount Olympus to the Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind. For she must take the lead, cut the channels. Admiral Cruzen's battle now begins. Through 600 miles of peril, the Admiral must bring his ships to the open Ross Sea and thus to the Bay of Whales and Little America. Cruising signals, follow me, and sets a careful course past icebergs. Thar she blows things a lookout. Thar she breaches close aboard. These huge whales measure up to 80 feet long, and each yields oil worth more than $2,000. The radar watch informs the bridge they've picked up a big ship, a Norwegian whaler, with her killer craft in close company. The Norsemen report the heaviest ice pack in 40 years. This year, they tell the Americans they're staying to the north of the ice. The Norwegian captain urges, exercise extreme caution. The American fleet proceeds. Here is the most treacherous navigation in all the seven seas. With every flow, every berg, a potential killer of ships. Seven-eighths of a berg lies underwater. Its jutting ice foot can slice into a ship like a can opener into a can. Ahead, the sky shows white streaks, the telltale ice blink, the warning reflection in the sky of the great pack. The ships meet their first tabular, the tabletop berg found only in the Antarctic. These tabulars are huge chips from the great ice barrier. They measure as long as 40 miles and are counted not in acres, but in square miles. The ships must follow a twisting, turning sea alley. 
cleared by the icebreaker. The submarine, Senate, brings up the rear. New formed ice, known from its shape as lily pad ice, offers no trouble. It is the bergy bits and the bergs themselves that form the hazard for the submarine. A little Adelie penguin comes aboard as pilot and rides the deck for two solid days. Navy cameramen find new subjects, a group of emperor penguins feeding in the lead. Lookout spot a flock of snow petrels, those hardiest of birds. Admiral Cruzen orders reconnaissance by helicopter and himself boards the plane as observer. For the first time, the helicopter serves as the eyes of the fleet to scout out a way through the ice. Somewhere to the south, Cruzen hopes to locate better going perhaps a lead heading toward Little America. Beyond the brash ice, the isolated lakes. At last, he sees his lead. Reconnaissance by helicopter has paid off. And just in time, for well, the helicopter's gas is running low. The long practice hours of pinpoint landing have not been wasted. The Admiral is safely back aboard. Cruzen changes course to head the fleet toward his lead. No open roadstead here, no channel markers. The turn is difficult for the big ships. Now to the men of the fleet comes one of nature's weirdest pictures, the Antarctic twilight. Eerie greens and pastel blues. Men who look grow silent, but long remember. Nor will they forget the dawns and the seals. through the pack was to have taken three or four days, but a week has passed, and the task force has made only 100 of the 600 miles across the pack. An emergency radio to the north wind summons instant help. The submarine, Senate, is caught. The jaws of two ponderous pressure flows have closed in, locking her in a white vice. The submarine is in acute danger of being sunk. realize now that the Senate may never get through. Cruising signals, resume course. Meanwhile, the Eastern Group has steamed to Peter the First Island, 1,250 miles northeast of the main base to be established at Little America. The Eastern Group's seaplane tender, Pine Island, sends a helicopter to scout the rugged coast. Hope is fulfilled when she relocates Scott's 37-year-old camp. This was the base for the ill-fated Britain's expeditions at the turn of the century. While the helicopter waits, the Americans look over the hut, finding only an abandoned sled. But back at the Pine Island, the helicopter meets trouble. Her rotors, heavy with ice, fail. She crashes only a few feet from the safety of the landing deck. <laughs> Within seconds, the Pine Island's crash boat reaches the sinking helicopter. The rescue crewmen, drilled for just such an emergency, yank Captain Dufek and his pilot safely aboard. Back at the Central Group, danger increases for the submarine. Crushing ice is now riding up over her decks. She is solidly frozen in. The Senate's situation is desperate. 
Clearly, she cannot undergo further risks. There are 85 men aboard. The ice locking her in is a solid pressure field spotted with birds. She must be taken back. The north wind cannot get the fleet through if constantly halted to rescue the submarine. icebreaker North Wind, with Admiral Cruzen in operational command, leaves the ships to await her return from the 400-mile round trip, towing the battered submarine, the Senate, north to the safety of the open sea. 1,200 miles to the west, 10 men set out from the western wing of the expedition on a hunt. For one of the seaplane tender Currituck's missions is to bring back specimens for the Federal Fish and Wildlife Commission. <laughs> The marine marksmen storm the ice floes. These seals are armed with tiger-like jaws, easily capable of mangling a man's arm or leg. The men risk the slashing jaws of the master bull himself. He's no calf, he fights to kill. Once secured, he finds out for the first time in his life what it's like to be petted. Hmm, that's not so bad. They total up their catch for the scientists back in Washington. Six leopards, and one rare Ross seal. The first Antarctic seal ever to fly through the air with the greatest of ease in a cargo net. Three days later, disaster presses close to the ships of the Central Group, helpless without the icebreaker. Their 2,000 men are marooned in a frozen sea. Below the water lines, damage control crews labor in icy water to shore up the inward bulging plates. The lives of all hands are at stake. The radio flashes an SOS to Cruzen, 200 miles to the north. Quickly, he orders the submarine to go on by herself to Scott Island and there operate as a weather reporting station. And now begins a race against time well worthy of high place in the traditions of the United States Coast Guard. receives black news from the flagship, Mount Olympus. Already five frames forward stove in, more weakening. Only the north wind can bring salvation to the 2,000 men of the stricken fleet. Dr. Seipel, Army ice veteran, volunteers to test the flows. If the ships must be abandoned, will the ice support the survivors? Cruzen awaits Dr. Seipel's verdict. Seipel reports the ice cannot be trusted. to go, the icebreaker is hemmed in by ice 20 feet above water, 50 feet below, in an area as great as 100 acres. Hopelessly gripped by the ice, the cargo ship Merrick is now in grave peril.
From the icebreaker, the fleet is now in sight over the pressure ridges. The desperate struggle of the north wind to reach them seems hopeless at times. The icebreaker counts her gain by yards now. Captain Thomas dares passages that normally he would avoid. It's the critical last round, a straight out slugging match. is the nearest ship, the Yancey. The Coast Guard icebreaker, North Wind, commands the only power operating in the whole frozen fleet. The Yancey and her 500 men are saved. Next, the Mary, heavy in the water with a hole in her bow below the waterline. wind reaches the flagship, Mount Olympus, cuts her free. The fleet has survived. 2,000 weary American sailors are safe. Beyond the great ice whirlpool that held them fast, they steam through the southern edge of the pack, through to the open waters of the Ross Sea, and little America dead ahead. Word of the deliverance of Admiral Cruzen's men reaches Admiral Byrd aboard the carrier, Philippine Sea, as she passes through the Panama Canal Pacific bound. Officers watch sharply. The glove tight fit of the 750 foot hull requires that the ship be kept exactly ruler edge true with the sides of the lock. The Philippine Sea navigates the canal in a day. As she heads south in the Pacific, Admiral Byrd devotes all his time to the flight ahead. Perilous, but of vital importance to naval aviation. Never before have such huge planes attempted carrier deck takeoffs. Never before have wheels and skis been combined in one landing gear. The wheels for deck takeoffs and the skis for landings on ice. The grave risk is that one may interfere with the other and bring disaster. Bird makes the decision. The wheels will have only a three inch clearance between skis and deck. Upon this will depend the lives of 40 men and he will lead the way. Triumph at last for Admiral Cruz. The entrance to the Bay of Wales, the famous 400-mile Ross Barrier. The Admiral can now relax. He, an American Admiral, has brought a modern fleet for the first time into the innermost waters touching the great unknown continent of Antarctica. This is an historic moment. At long last, Admiral Byrd has realized his dream of many years of reaching little America with men and ships of the United States Navy. Reception committee. Hey, gang, hurry up. Look at the big penguins in our bay. Big penguins, bigger than emperors. And big black mountains that move. They walk like us, but not quite the right way. Come on, gang. We've got to go see what gives. Big penguins and their big black mountains, the ships, are on 24-hour duty with the first job to secure all mooring lines. Big timbers sunk deep in the ice serve as anchors. They're called dead men in sea parlance, perhaps because they're buried. Slip toggles are rigged for quick release in case ice forces an emergency getaway. Unloading, reconnaissance planes first, next hauling equipment. The Marine Corps weasels, heavy-duty caterpillars, and trucks, 40 in all. Here are no port facilities, but the Navy shows its self-sufficiency as it did throughout the war in operating at sea without bases or with improvised bases. Here are no docks or roads, yet all freight aboard three heavily laden ships is hauled two miles over the ice up to Little America. Dogs next, a barking, tugging boatload of huskies, and the pups growing fatter and bigger every day. All are happy with the welcome smell of snow in their nostrils. This is home. This is fun. But this is work, too, for time is short, and the dogs must haul their share of the tonnage. Halt. Trouble ahead. 
Pressure ridges block the way inland to Little America. Even the largest caterpillars are stalled. The call goes out for dynamite crews, Navy's trained demolition teams, seasoned on enemy beaches. They must blast the 50-foot ridges, clear the way to meet the expedition timetable. The ridges are deep. The blasting takes hours. CBs and their bulldozers follow, smooth out the road for the big cats. In two hours, they bridge crevasses 100 feet deep. And so 10,000 tons of gear brought down by the cargo ships start moving up to Little America. Work goes steadily forward. CBs, with all hands helping, use every one of the 24 hours of daylight in the South Pole summer. Caterpillars with snowshoe oversized treads accomplish in hours the work that in old days hundreds of dogs could do only in weeks. Air strips, smoothed out with drags, take high priority. Bird has flashed word from the Philippine Sea, now standing by off the pack ice, that he's ready to fly his R-4Ds in. It's up to the work parties to make up the time lost in the pack ice. Up to these men to work while gusty winds drive flesh-cutting gravel-like snow across the open, or to dig deep for storehouse foundations. Food dumps grow steadily. Here is the favorite hangout of the veteran husky, Ricky. Born at Little America 12 years before, and still hungry. Each hour brings other buildings to completion. Knockdown Wanigans grow magically, and the air headquarters Quonset is ready. Snow blocks are dug out for windbreaker walls. These blocks are the adobe of Little America. Good idea, squawks the sidewalk superintendent of the base. Good idea. These big penguins do right well to bear in mind that when she blows down here, she's liable to blow your eyelashes off. The little Adley shows no fear. What? Smoke? Silly idea. The ships are all but emptied. The caterpillars and go devils live up to their wartime good name. Within 70 hours, the CBs are hauling in the last 500 tons of essentials. Only a few more cases to be broken out. The local waterworks is the pride of the sea bees. Three GI cans of snow produce one can of water, purest in the world. You keep your furnace going, it makes steam, which melts snow, which makes water. Simple. Simple once CB Engineering in Washington had figured it out before ever the first ship left port. And now, the ordered streets of a tent city that is Little America the Fourth come into being where three days before the primeval snow lay unbroken.